I'd like to read you a couple things before we jump right in. Uh, again, from the Emerald Tablet. Uh, it's a good little book. I, I read this thing periodically. You get started, it's hard to not get it, get out of it. It's hard for me to get out of it because it just resonates so much with me. It's very ancient writing. Uh, so, let me read this to you. It says, Hark you, old man, and listen to my voice. Open, I think that might be the, one of the key words for today, is open. Yes. Mm -hmm. Open your mind, space, and drink of my wisdom. Dark is the pathway of life that you travel. Many the pitfalls that lie in your way. Seek ye ever to gain greater wisdom. Attain and it shall be light on your way. I'm just reminded of a story that I heard Wayne Dyer say years and years ago about a guy that went down an alley and fell into a pit. And when he got out of that the next day, he come down through that way, and he went down that same alley and fell into that pit. And he repeated that over and over. And I, I shortened it to Wayne Dyer when he tells it, it's just phenomenal. And so finally one day, he said, you know, I'm not going down that alley no more. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, how many times do you have to go down the same road, the same path, mm -hmm. and keep falling and doing it and repeating the same old thing until finally one day? Well, thank God, one day we will wake up. Mm -hmm. Pray that day comes sooner. That's sooner. Amen. You so, do the same thing over and over, you get the same result? Exactly. Same right. thing over. Okay. So he says that that, that was his first thing, first paragraph. Open thy soul, O man, to the cosmic, and let it flow in as one with your soul. Light is eternal, darkness is fleeting. Seek ye ever, O man, for the light. Know Ye that ever as light fills your being, darkness for for thee shall soon disappear. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Now I want you to I want to make this distinction in this very point that when you read material like this or the Bible or anywhere else and it talks about light, yes, it's referring to the sunlight as a symbol, but the sun is also referring to knowledge. The key thing is knowledge. Have to, I'll, I'll come back to that forever. <laughs> Knowledge is the key because knowledge is light. If you walk in the light, you're walking in the knowledge. If you're walking in darkness, you're walking in ignorance. And ignorance many times is just the um, mass amount of the materiality. In other words, just walking by the carnal mind, walking by that which blinds me. So it's not, not talking literally of just darkness at night, which we're taught to be afraid of, most people are, or the daylight, the sun that lights the day. Those are metaphors. Again, everything's filled with metaphors and symbols. And so it's important that we grasp that. So and the next the next paragraph full of phrase says, open your soul to the to the bright, to the bright bringers. I'm sorry, open your soul to the bringers of brightness. Let them enter and fill you with light. Lift up thy eyes to the light of the cosmos. Keep thou ever thy face to the goal. Only by gaining the light of all wisdom art thou one with the infinite goal. Seek ye ever the oneness eternal. Seek ye ever the light of the goal. So, in other words, knowledge, thats it's like precious gold and silver. And when you find it, all it can do is enrich you and lighten you. And I want to make a little quote from a book that Saad Garou wrote. And uh, I thought it was really a good book and it resonated with me. And so I want to share it with this, this teaching this afternoon. And uh, it's his book called Inner Engineering. That was, that's his book that he wrote. And on page 68, he says these words. He says, responsibility is not burdensome. Responsibility is not burdensome. And then he talks about boundaries. Have you ever thought about that? Boundaries. He said boundaries, which, uh, parentheses, boundaries, which are beliefs. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. Is that? 
mm -hmm. kind of boundaries, which are beliefs. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah. Why? Because you put a boundary there that's locked up in a belief about that. Yeah. Boundaries, which are beliefs, the things that you're taught, such so as there are burdens, they'll weigh you down. Your belief system yeah. is that which depresses you, weighs you down, limits you, and stops you from being all that you can possibly be. Because many times, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Boundaries are burdensome. Beliefs are burdensome. If you draw yourself a boundary, whether of idol, ide ideology, in other words, beliefs, color, creed, race, religion, you cannot move beyond it and you end up stuck for no reason at all. These boundaries only end up breeding fear. God, that's one of the that's one of the major tools that the religious community and church uses against you. They want you to be afraid. They want you to be afraid of God. They want you to be afraid of crossing the line. They want you to be afraid of getting outside the boundary. That's why they harp and they preach on you shall not. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, I mean, it, you know, it just over and over. And you know what? They have us so fearful. I'm afraid if I do that, God won't like me. I'm afraid if I do that, I'll miss God. My, my sister, my only sister, she has been a devout Baptist, I guess, all the days of her life. And I mean, my sister, a devout Baptist, is the truth. She's, she's as pure of a person as there ever was. And she has, just like anybody else, she has little uh, quirks and habits or whatever things that she does that, that uh, or whatever. But she does have it. But as far as anybody that ever has a pure thought or, or good with my sister, she was that way. But yeah, I remember when I first started pastoring, she said, well, Lynn, why don't you be a Baptist pastor? You're such a good preacher. Why don't you be a... I said, Diane, I can't embrace them, and I can't hold on to their ideology. It, it doesn't resonate. I can't find the truth in it. She said, well, okay. <laughs> so, she said, but you know, all these years I've been Baptist, she said, I really don't know if I died if I go to hell or not. Now, you, now, hey, again, my sister, she walks the line as far as religion and her beliefs go. And you know, that was her own words. I'm afraid if I die, I might go to hell. That kind of fear is damaging. That kind of a boundary is what destroys your life. It harms your life. And so many of us get caught and we can get locked up in that. So that's what Sadhguru winds up saying. These boundaries only end up breeding fear, hatred, and anger. But if, you, if your responsibility is limitless, where is your boundary? There's no boundary. There's no burden. Anyway, I thought that was a real good statement. That's a fact. My sad guy ruled it and what he said. And so this is something that I wrote. Most of us, and I read this this morning, but I, I need to read it again because I'm talking about opening our mind outside the box and yeah. I know that I say things and then people start asking questions well what did he mean did he? and again like we talked about this morning did I mean that I didn't believe in Jesus see that's something that you concoct I don't concoct that I don't say that that's not an issue to me if you would listen to me real closely it would take you it would take you a long time to listen to me closely because I would say so much over a long period of time you'd realize I'm not trying to take away anything from anybody and what they believe. I'm trying to give a greater picture of what they think they believe and let it become knowledge for them. Let it be something that you know that that will free you. When you know it, you embrace it, you hang on to it. So, to be open-minded is, is what I really share is open yourself up to something outside your box. And I remember, I remember, uh, again, I, I was preaching traditional Christianity 40, 40 years ago and did for quite a number of years with a great big question mark because my study couldn't line up with my preaching. Where did my preaching come from? It didn't come out of my studies. My preaching come out of what I heard other preachers preach. And so I, I built my preaching around what other preachers preached Why? because it was popular. It's what the people wanted to hear. It's what the yeah. masses would come to. 
But all the time, my research is saying that's not true. That's not true. And so finally, I didn't preach that many years. And then finally, I can't do that no more. And so I had actually established one of the first charismatic churches there in, there in North Georgia. Back, I started that church in late 79. And by, by the mid, uh, mid part of 85, I couldn't do it no more. And that church, we were running, we were actually running close to 300 people. We had about 10 acres of property. We had a lot of money in the bank. I was the, I was the father, the founder, the builder of that church. Everybody would come into that church. I placed them into places. A lot of my drinking buddies come into that church. And I finally said, I can't preach this no more. I said, I have to change everything about what I'm saying because my study, my research does not validate what I have been regurgitating that, that y'all like to hear from Kenneth Copeland and mm -hmm. Kenneth Hagin and mm -hmm. Fred K.C. Price and uh, yeah. Caps and etc. Jimmy Swaggart, you name it, you know, all yeah. the popular preachers who I, everybody's flocking to hear what they're saying. I couldn't tell anybody they, they were going to hell anymore. Well, that, good for you. I couldn't, I couldn't embrace that one to start out, yeah, I'll start again. So, uh, I began to preach out of my research and my study. And guess what? They begin to leave. <laughs> oh, okay. So you know what? I finally decided rather than to do this, I will resign. And in midpoint 85, I had I had founded that church, and it was at that time it was the growingest, largest charismatic church in that area at that time in in the mid 80s. I said, I can't do that any longer. I said, I'm going a completely different direction. So at, so to do this. I will resign. I place a good friend of mine who was a Baptist pastor who got filled with the Holy Spirit through my teaching and me and him fellowshipping. And I said, I'm just going to put him in a, over this church. And you guys, they all knew him. I said, y'all can vote on it. You agree? And they said, no, there ain't going to be no vote. We don't want you to leave. I said, well, you're going to leave then. Because what I'm going to share, I'm not sure if you're ready to listen to it. Because I had been sharing it and had been leaving it. Now, I think you may have heard me talk about it. I was invited one time. You know, I had, I had a worship team. I had 20 something, 26 people in my worship team. I had professional people. In my, I, had, I had people in my worship team who had actually cut their own albums. I, I mean, we had a phenomenal... And I, had, I had ordained ministers. I had college students in my worship team at that time, back then. And I, I was invited one evening to come over. Me and Connie was invited to come to a dinner at one of my worship leaders' house. I said, oh yeah, okay, fine, we'll come over, da 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 we got over there. And this person had also cut an album, was a phenomenal, I mean, she, she can go professionally anytime, tremendous musician, had a degree, uh, and so when I got there, I thought it was just gonna be a few of us, and when I got there, all of my leadership, all of my worship team, there must have been 30 cars in the driveway, I thought, oh, I know what this is, one of them meetings. This one of them meetings to fry Lynn. And that's exactly what it was. You know what they said? The bottom line of what they said? Pastor, we just love you. You have the best message. But, I said, okay, here's where, but, we're afraid you're going to start preaching the manifest, the manifest sons of God. I said, really? I said, well, you know, you know me, I'm going to throw scripture back at you. And I said, have you heard me say anything? No, 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 we love what you're saying. No, no, no. We... I said, well, what makes you think that? I said, aren't you the manifestation of the sons of God? And, oh, well, yeah, but. <laughs> but. I mean, now we put that but. That means that they're fixing to do that goat thing on me. You know what I mean? They made up their lives. Yeah, and so I said, well. And I left that meeting, and I, I told Connie, I said, I'm resigning to the church. Well, you can't do that. You start to do it. What are you going to do? I said, I'm resigning that church and selling my tire business. And that's exactly what I did. And the moment I turned in my resignation, the first assemblies of God in, in uh, Lafayette, we call it Lafayette. I think some other people call it Lafayette. But North Georgia is Lafayette. The first assemblies of God in Lafayette, who had, had heard me preach at some full gospel businessmen meeting and other places, they called me. I had just resigned my church. The church wouldn't even accept my resignation. They said, I, no, you can't resign. I resigned the church. First assembly called and said, we want you to come over here and preach. 
uh, you know, we want you to, in other words, we want you to come try out to be our pastor. We'll vote on I said, well, I'll be glad to come and preach. I'll be glad to come over and share what's in my heart. And I did. I went over there. And they, they did. They voted unanimously, 100% for me to be their pastor. They said, you're going to be our pastor. Uh, I said, look, I own my own home. I don't, uh, I don't live in a parsonage. Uh, oh, that's fine. We will let you live in a parsonage for free, and you can keep your home in Dalton. Because see, Lafette is just over the mountain, over the hill from Dalton. It's just a little town over the hill. And I had a real close friend who lived over there. And I said, no, I'm sorry. I really appreciate y'all's offer. Not interested. Anyway, long story short, that's when I changed, and I began to preach what my research told me. And that's when people began to walk away. You heard me tell this story about Gary Tice, who was a real good friend of mine. I was close to Gary. I love Gary. Gary kept saying, Lynn, I know that you know things and you're not preaching. I said, yeah. <laughs> well, why don't you preach it? Open it up. Just, just let it all, all go. And Gary Tice, you just have to admit, he, he could not love him. He was a precious man of God. Didn't have an enemy, number one. He would come in the door and he would do his little two-step dance. <laughs> And you know Gary was in the house. <laughs> and Gary said, Lynn, I'm going to know that you broke totally out of religion when you let me bring an ashtray in here smoke. Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, Gary, I, I wouldn't mind. It wouldn't bother me, but everybody around you probably wouldn't like it. <laughs> he said, I know you know things you're not saying. I said, yeah, Gary, the reason I'm not saying is I don't want you to leave. I like you. Huh? <laughs> and so, so anyway, I finally come to the point that I said, you know, I have to say, what I have, what I see, I can't compromise. I can't compromise it. I have to say what I see, and I realize it's outside the box and the boundaries of so many people. And I don't mean it in any way to be defensive or offensive. I just say, my goodness, this is the most freeing stuff I've ever found in my life. And it's right here in this beautiful book. If we can just see it and, and, and dig it out. So most of us have been taught not to be open but to only trust those things that we've been taught to believe. Mm. Have you ever been taught to believe a certain truth and you found out that truth was a lie, etc.? And yes, you all have. So it's hard to be open-minded. I say that quite often, that it's hard to be open-minded but because uh, the book that we call the Bible is not a history book. It's not about literal characters. I know that's a tough pill right there. It is not about literal characters. It's about the character of your body. It's about the different things going on inside your body. To take, to take these different characters, take these different events, take these different things, and apply them to your body, it will open you to a whole different game, period. It will open you into the Word of the Spirit. It will open you up into a thing outside yourself that's already within yourself. And that's the most beautiful thing about it. And 1 Corinthians says, when I was a child, I acted like a child, I spoke like a child, but when I became a man, and that to me is where we need to go. We need to put away childish things. We need to go ahead and become the men and the women God designed us to be and grow up this little spiritual brat. I'm sorry, talking all of our little spiritual brat that whips and whines and says, oh, I'm that's too hard. Okay, I don't believe that. Grow up. It's time to grow up. It's time for us to be stretched. And that's exactly why I feel that I, I know, I know that the Spirit of God is doing to all of us. So with that, if you go with me to Psalms chapter 40, we're going to jump in. And I'm going to tell you, you need to hang with me close because I'm going to blow your mind out of the book of Revelation with a few things. And I know that, and but you'll see it. And when you say it, you'll say, oh, I didn't know that. And I, and I realize that. We did none of us know it because we have been taught not to know it. We've been taught to, to know something that's different. We've been taught to know a lie and call the lie the truth. And we give our life for that. And we get as excited about the things that are the truth. If we can get excited about that, my God, we will fill up, we'll fill up stadiums. And it should be. Because people long to know the truth and they don't even realize it. They're starving for it. They're very hungry for it. Okay. Psalms 140. I mean Psalms 40. I'm sorry. Psalms chapter 40 verse 6. 
Verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. And of course, you know how I use this passage and you go over it into uh, Hebrews and they quote this passage and misquote it. Like I showed you this morning, there's a lot of quoting and misquoting that goes on in the Bible. Especially when you carry a passage from the Old Testament into the New Testament, many times they change the whole context. And you tell me if that didn't change the whole context from it, which was the vision, which was what yeah. God said, mm -hmm. to he that you're thinking about is a person that's going to come in the future. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that just that one little change, just one word, yeah. one word, it, he, changed the it to a he completely mm -hmm. changes because the whole thing of a fact, I want to go back and finish chapter 2 in Habakkuk because it says, when this knowledge comes, Where's that knowledge at? That's God speaking to me within me. That's what God, that's the vision. It's what God's speaking to within me. When this knowledge comes forth, it will flood the whole earth with the glory of God. That's why the back had said that. That was the thing that you that we need to get to. Because that's exactly what's happening right now. The, I mean, the earth, everything is groaning, it's, it's travailing, it's trying to pull out of us. What we are, what we've always been destined yes, to design to be. Yes. Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. That should not have to be explained. That shouldn't have to be done whatever. God did not desire to take His only Son, hang Him on a tree, and murder Him and kill Him because He lost His, his human race. Now that's ridiculous, but that's what we believe hook, line, and sinker. Who, who was Jesus supposed to be? Was He not supposed to be in your in your mind, that what you've been taught, was He not supposed to be the sacrifice for sin? Yeah. And read that passage right there says God wasn't interested in a sacrifice or an offering. He said He didn't desire it. He didn't require it. It was not His will. And I can take you to many places in Isaiah 111. Tell you the same thing. Take you to Hosea 6.6, 6, Jeremiah 6.30. I mean, all those scriptures, some places God said, your sacrifices were like a stink in my nose. I didn't yeah. like the smell of them. Why? God didn't look at you and me as lost sinners. See, we completely disrupted that word sin. Don't even know what it is. Because yeah. you have two words. You've got harmatia, harmaton in Greek. In the, in the Hebrew, you've got chata, chata'a. Both words are translated sin. Both words mean something totally different. In both cases, both words have an archery term to them. It simply means you didn't hit the target, so shoot again. And the other one means that, that an offense that was inflicted upon you, inflicted upon you. In other words, somebody crossed the boundary, a moral boundary in your life, and when they did, they stained you. Why? Because it brought hurt inside you. It brought pain. It brought condemnation, whether it's an abuse, whether it was verbal, or whether it's sexual, or however it happened, it brought that that's what God said is sin. That's pain. And God wants to heal that pain. Jesus looks out at everybody that's contrary to him and says, Father, don't hold it against them. I don't. Does he not? But yet, you know what we want to do? We want to throw stones out. We want to condemn them. Send them to hell. Burn them. You know, just hurt them. Hurt them. They hurt us. Hurt them back. No, if we can get this, we all have had this boundary cross living life. You cannot... That's why Paul says in Romans, for all have this sin. Actually, the word should be offense, this boundary that was crossed, this moral. You build a moral boundary. Whether you're a little boy or a little girl, when you're two or three year old, the intuitive part of you knows that there's a moral boundary here. When that moral boundary gets crossed, whether it's sexually, verbally, abusively, or you name the list, you begin to build an offense there. That offense is what the word sin means. It doesn't mean, well, I, I got drunk, I had sex, I cussed, I, I, you know, I, I wore the wrong clothes. We got, Connie and I got kicked out of church. We went to a church when we, we just get started. We was in our late 20s. We didn't know nothing about church. We didn't know the rules of church. We had two kids and a baby. Brand new baby. We were in our late 20s. We was really doing good. We had scraped and scraped to buy enough money to get our two oldest girls school clothes. And so we thought we'd go to church this Sunday night. Well, we was in church, and they had this guest 
old white-headed preacher, and he's 80 year old. He was a snake handler back way back in the long mm -hmm. years back, Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we walked in, and my wife at that time had she had on uh, pants. I can't remember, but it was a decent pants outfit, nice clothes. And my little girls both had on new little girls' blue jeans. But well, we walked in and sat down, and all of a sudden, the preacher started preaching on Jezebel, and he's looking at, he's looking at Connie. You know, Connie's got old wow. earrings, you know, lipstick, makeup, hair all fixed up. He kept looking at her and coming, and I thought, I thought, wow, man, he's doing great. He thinks my wife's Jezebel. But I didn't know who Jezebel was. I wouldn't know Jezebel from Rezebel. I wouldn't know anyone. <laughs> So I had no idea what he was doing. And then finally a guy come up and went over and says, you, you guys are going to have to leave. Oh my I said, what? Goodness. Yeah, y'all going to need to leave. I said, okay. He embarrassed me. I didn't know what to do. Here I, I got thrown out of bars, but the first time I've been thrown out of church. <laughs> so we left. Well, I had a tire business at that time. And... Uh, the pastor who had been coming to my tire business and really had got to know me, him and his wife, and we really got to know them and really enjoyed their company. And these ones having this revival. <laughs> They're going to revive me. You know what I'm saying? They're going to revive me and my, me and my hellbound family. He, come, he said, man, I am so sorry. He said, Brother Carter, he didn't know. He da, 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 da. He said, you know, you know, we don't, me and his, him and his wife, he said, we don't believe that way. I know we're in that church. I said, hey, I called his name, but I said, no problem. I said, man, we love y'all. I said, I don't even know what he was talking about. <laughs> and everybody, well, that's good. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I, you know, but you all know that this is true. This is stuff that happens, and it happened to me in my journey. And so, you know, when I say stuff like this, what I just said, God didn't desire it. I, surely to God, something in you had the question, why would God kill his own child? Mm, yeah. you, you can't get away with that in society right. today. Yeah. Can you go kill your children, one of your boys, yeah. to save all the rest of your boys? Oh, well, I, this one's special. I'm going to kill him so I can save all these other special. But you, you got to have something inside you that says that's not logically sound or reasonable. Yeah. It is not, folks. It's really not. I realize this is a CD and DVD they go out. I realize that. But think. My God, use your brain to think. Use your mind. Think. Pull it, pull it, and say if it's not logical, if it doesn't make good reason, then maybe you ought to put a big question mark there when you have Scripture after Scripture after Scripture that clearly says God was not interested in sacrifice and offerings. So you can change that to anything you want to. I can give you plenty more scripture to go with it if you need them or whatever. Notice what he said. He says, uh, sacrifice and offering you did not desire mine ears has thou opened. That's the key word right there, open. That if God does not open your ear, you won't hear what I'm saying. What I'm saying will reflect. You'll think I'm saying something I'm not saying and then you'll go tell somebody what you thought I said I didn't say. You will Happens all the time. That splits church right down the middle. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many of them split over the years. Yeah. Why? Because they weren't open to listen outside the box of their boundary, their belief system that had them in bondage as much as it's trying to put me in that bondage. Yeah. God help us from that. My ears hast thou opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings for sin you do not require. Right there it is, right there. Tear it out if you want to. Just, just rip that page out of the Bible. In fact, don't worry. I'll give you some more that you can rip out. If he didn't require them, then why in the world did he have to kill one of his only sons? He didn't require it. He didn't desire it. He didn't want it. Hmm. You've never heard a preacher say that. I know you have. Then said I, Lord, I come to do in the volume of the book is written to me to do your will. I delight to do your will, O God. Yea, thy law. Everybody say law. 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 What do you think of when you hear that? I'm going to tell you what you think of when you hear that. You think of boundaries. Mm -hmm. You That's exactly what you And I'm going to tell you what you're thinking more than anything. You're thinking of ten boundaries. Mm -hmm. But you don't even know what those ten boundaries are because number one, they are not boundaries. They are not law like you and I think of as law. They're, they have nothing to do with law. 
as you and I think of love. Actually, it's the Greek word Torah. Now, what does the word Torah mean? And I pray you can hear this. Torah actually means a principle. A principle. Everybody say principle. 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 A principle is not a boundary. A principle is not a law. A principle is something that you live by. You live by certain principles inside your gut. Those gut, those gut principles are written on your heart according to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8 says that God put His law principles in your heart. He didn't write the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not in your heart. They ain't no one of you got that in your heart. Hello? Is that no? No. You don't have any thou shalt nots in your heart, but you have principles in your heart and just don't know how to listen to them. Don't even really know for sure what all of them are. But there are principles there. And that's what the word Torah means. Now, if you wanted to use the word boundary, or if you wanted to use the word law, it's in the Old Testament too. And the word is chakok, which actually means a statute, a written law. That is not what Moses got on the mountain. Moses didn't get the chakok. Moses got the Torah on the law. Our problem is we didn't know the difference between Torah and Chuk'ok. Chuk'ok are boundaries. They are not principles. They have nothing to do with principles. The Torah are the principles, and those principles are within your heart, and they're there. God put those principles there. So, now, to be open, and that's exactly what we are, and that's where we're going. Let's go back to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. I said a lot already. I guess that we could probably follow and stop. You could ask questions. What did you mean when you said that? Because lots of people hear things that I didn't say. Did I say there was no Jesus? I didn't say that. No. I didn't say that at all. And I, and I said that this morning in, in our conversation. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying. I'm not saying that there was no David. I will say this. I will say this. There is not one shred of evidence that there's a little Jesus. Not one shred. If you wanted to take the tomb of his resurrection to say that's a literal shred, when you go to Israel, you have three different tombs mm -hmm. to choose from. And all three of them yeah. are the literal tomb that Jesus rose from. All three of them. Did he raise, did he raise from three different places? As a matter of fact, if you will look at the last chapter of the book of Luke, on the, rep, on the day of ascension, on the day of ascension, if you look at the end of the book of Luke, Jesus' ascension is from one town, mm -hmm. and if you look in Acts chapter 1, Jesus' ascension is in another town 35 miles yes. away. Yes. <laughs> did we have two Jesuses ascending on the same day? Or did the writers screw it all up? Duh. Huh? I mean, you know, I have, I can throw you too many wrenches in your cogs. Too many. Too many. Are they errors? Not to me anymore. Used to, I would grapple over what the error or misprint or this, that, and other. Now then I realize they are the views of different principles and different things of God that now that I know how to look at them and when I know how to view them. If I don't know how to view them, I tell you, you can get yourself really confused. You try to establish a, a literal person. You cannot find not one literal biblical character in history, period. Not a David, not a Solomon, not an Abraham, not a Moses. You cannot find not one, not the very first one, not a Noah. You can't even find anywhere the markings of a so-called great big boat. If you'll study Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, that's the story of the ark, Noah and the ark. You'll find Noah, what Noah represents is abundance of grace. And you'll find that the abundance of God's grace is big enough to float you no matter how big you are because you are the ark of God. And when you start to see everything that's in the description of the ark is again a description of you because you are that which carries the principles of God. It's written in you. It's in your heart. God didn't leave it. Not one stone unturned, but if you know how to see it, you know how to look back into it, you begin to, to redeem that which belongs to you. That belongs to me and you. And that's exactly what we're all about. I mean, you know, whether, you know, whether we are 10 or 10,000, 
Right now, we are, we are redeeming these things that have been stolen and taken away from us. These phenomenal truths. And I guarantee you, these things will rock you to your core if you listen. If you just grab hold of it, listen to it, and chew on it. Just chew on it. And if, I, you know, if I'm saying too much, going too fast, raise your hand or say, wait a minute, brother Lee. And sometimes people on the CDs, they get upset and say, tell them to shut up and hold their question until the end. You were just a preaching of good. And they said something. They're interrupted. I said, well, it doesn't bother me. And many times, I, I, sometimes the distractions are there for people that's listening and not seeing all this. I said, get the DVD. <laughs> you, can, you can see it. And uh, yeah, I have done this for so long. The questions are the the in interjections that people make don't bother me, you know. Whether it's an agreement or disagreement, it's fine. It's okay. For me, maybe not for people listening. Okay? <laughs> All right, the Revelation chapter 1. Goodness, the Revelation. Apocalypse. This is the uncovering. And it's the uncovering of this, again, there was no name Jesus until the, between 1200 and 1240. I mean, you can just go look that up. I really encourage you to go look that up. There was no Jesus until that period. And a lot of people say, yeah, but he, the story of Jesus is built on the story of Joshua. Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But there was no real Joshua. But the story of Joshua is about this right here, which this right here, this oil, this Christos, this Zeus, it is about your salvation. And that's what that's about. What is your salvation? Your salvation is raising this oil. Yes. That's what yes. it's about. That's what yes. salvation is about. Isn't it about resurrection? Yes. And that, well, what is the resurrection? It's the resurrection of the oil back up to the back yes. up to the 12 power cranial nerve. Right here's the 12 power cranial nerve. Did you hear what I said? Yes. 12 pair. That means that uh, this is a medical term. You just look it up if you would like sometimes. It's a medical term. 12 pair cranial nerves, which means that there are 12 elders that sit like yes. this. These elders are actually, 12 of them are actually major nerves that come around on each side of the throne, each side of the throne room, there's 12 on each side, come around, now, now i got him looking like a herd. They come around, and, and they come into one nerve right here, the channel, okay? This is Santa, this is sacrum, your sacrum bone is right here, sacrum bone looks yeah. just exactly like that, it's a pump. Just like that. And that sacrum bone as a pump that pumps the oil back up the chimney to the colostrum. The colostrum sits right here at the base of the spine, right behind the pineal gland, so that it through these nerves it can connect to this entire nervous system in your whole body. These are the 24 elders that sit around the throne. Have you ever heard of 24 elders sitting around the throne? <laughs> And there they are. They're in our physical body. So all of these characters, Joshua, the story of Joshua, is the story of salvation or the raising again, resurrection. When you talk about resurrection, we're not talking about grave opening up. God. We're not talking about old bodies coming, being covered back over flesh, coming up out of them. Oh, God. Now that's it. Now that is Yeah. <laughs> this is it, the, notice. This is the uncovering. I, again, I, I use this this little analogy. You can't see what's behind it. I pull the cover back. Now you can see it. I am pulling the cover back, letting you see what this Isbus Christos is. That's what this book is about. It's about the Isbus Christos, the oil. The unction. Ah, oh, I love to say it. Um, you can feel that if you say it right now. You feel it right down here. Oh, unction. Hey, you gotta be good right there. Unction. I got that unction, y'all. It's a rub. So this is the pulling back 
with the uncovering of this unction as it's being raised from the grave. As, as Santa Claus is going back up the chimney from the sacrum, sac and actually the sacrum, it means Santa, or Santa means holy. And that's called the holy claustrum. And that's exactly what it's doing. Raising it all back up to the claustrum, back up to Claus. Santa Claus. Up and down the chimney. He goes. Up and down the chimney. The revelation of Jesus or Isvus Christos. Christ, Christ is not a first name. Christ is not a second name. These characters are meant to be personal pronouns. These characters are meant to be f functions and facts fashions of your physical body. Mm -hmm. And they are. And they are. Uh, and gave him him show that his service things much come. This moves very speedily, rapidly. And he did it signified. That's a real important word. Just, you know, get your concordance. Look it up. Semanio. It means to write, mark, uh, scribe in signs and symbols. In signs and symbols. In signs and symbols. So the book is signs and symbols about what? About the Isvus Christos. About the resurrection of the oil that's inside your body. This is what this book is about. The characters in it, the things, events, everything in it is about that. Not future, not prophecy, nothing at all like that, but the right, right here and now. <laughs> right, right, what's going on right here and now. And then I want you, that's what's happening. And you remember we go back to Habakkuk, we're going to go back over there because of time, but you remember Habakkuk says, I stood upon my watchtower. Why, was I, why am I up on my watchtower? Why am, I, why am I listening? What am I looking for? I'm listening for the voice of God, the vision of God, the voice of God to speak within me, not outside me. Everybody, right. God, did I hear you out there? Sir? Please call to me, God, and all the time it's going on inside. We just have to learn to turn. Inside, turn the turn the thing inside. Now you just got to get it all up the tower. Got to get it up here, right? Look here, I'm fixing to really crank it right here. Watch this now. Verse twelve. I turn. Now look at this. Watch this. I'm going. Look here. Look here. Now I I turn. Is that not what you see when you read that? Mm -hmm. Huh? Is that what you see? Well, listen to this. That is the Greek word epistreso. And you know what that word means? Epi. Uh, it, epi is, 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 again, there's a lot of these Greek words that's actually made up of two different words, like church is ekklesia. This one right here is epistreso. And you know what it means? It means to turn within. Huh? It doesn't mean to turn about. It doesn't mean to go a different direction. It means to turn within. Look what it says. And I turn within myself to see. Isn't that exactly what Habakkuk said? I'm up on my watchtower to see yes. how he will instruct me. How he will, how he will correct me through his instructions. Why? Because something in my life needs tweaking, so now he's giving me instructions on what to do to tweak it. What do you think this is about? What is God doing for us right now? Yes. Is He not tweaking us? Is He yes. not yes. helping us tweak, tweak yes. a little here, tweak a little bit there? And we hear it, okay, 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 okay. It's not painful. It shouldn't be painful. It's not meant to be painful. It's meant to be instructive. It's meant to be edifying. Building up. Yes. Yes. That's why sometimes I get to build up myself. I don't want to take off and ruin it. <laughs> Getting all this energy going. So I turn within myself. Within myself. Oh. Within myself to see what the voice that spake within me and begin at be, and being turned or being looked within, looking within. What did I see? What did I see? What did I see? Seven golden candles. Woo! <laughs> I mean, we start right out of the get get. What are we talking? We're talking about you. We're talking about you. The seven golden candlestick in the Old Testament mythology is a reference to you. It's a reference to the seven endocrine gland that builds a physical body. That's the first basic stepping stone in the womb. When that, when that, that seed that represents light penetrates that egg that represents matter, that spirit and matter being 
join together to create, to build a house, a body for God to live in. And God builds that house. He builds that tabernacle. He builds that temple inside of the body in nine months. And then He pushes it out. And then He moves in it permanently through its breath. And now the marriage is consummated. The marriage is taking place. And now you and God are one. You are holy. W-H-O-L-Y. Yes, yes. Uh... Hallelujah. I turn to see the voice. That's speaking within me. And being turned within, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, hallelujah. What did he do? He's looking in the mirror of himself. He's looking in the mirror of himself. And actually in the Old Testament, no, I'm sorry, not in the Old Testament, in Greek mythology. Greek mythology is built on this, this term. They have a lot of these different terms. Dues, demon, inversa. Dues, Demon in person. Duess is where we get our word double. Demon is where we get our word demon. In versa means looking in the mirror to see yourself. You want to see your demons? You want to see the demons of Gennar? The demons? Huh? Do you want to see those demons? Look in the mirror. You, want, you know when Jesus went and cast a thousand, a legion of demons out? Look in the mirror. Do the same thing for you. Look in the mirror. I mean, every bit of this is symbolic, but you have to understand the terminology. And sad to say, the priestcraft has robbed us of proper terminology. So we don't know. We don't realize what's being said and what's, what's, what's happening and what's taking place. The seven golden candlestick, which is the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to his foot and girt about the pouch with a golden girdle. His head is higher than that. It goes on and it describes it in verse 17, just for time's sake. And when, I, and when I saw, in other words, when I turned within myself, I saw the seven golden candlestick, I saw my chakras, I saw my intricate glands, I saw myself like a beautiful rainbow, I saw myself as Psalms 134 said, I was, a, I was a woven garment, woven out of these seven multiple colors, I was beautiful because I am. And I turned within myself and I saw it. Hallelujah. I saw him and I fell at his feet. As one dead, and I laid, he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Don't be afraid, for I am. I'm the first, I'm the last. I mean, you know, this is exactly like God simply saying to you and me, I'm anointing you. I am unctioning you. Hallelujah. I'm raising this Christ up oh in you. God. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. So be it. And he gave me the keys of hell and of death. He gave me the keys of hell and of death. Where do we get that passage from? That passage comes from Matthew chapter 16. You know, and I used to say this to the Christians back when I was still preaching what the popular preachers was preaching. My first three or four or five years. I was still preaching that. My research, my research is telling me all kinds of other things. And I... I Y'all on page with me. Y'all... And getting it, Barbie to have an epiphany. Oh. I mean, ain't no problem with that, just to pick yes. out. <laughs> it's going oh, epiphany. No, I mean, it says it, it's right there. It's just right here in front of your face, right, right in your face, really. <laughs> just right in your face. Jesus said, I, I was preaching in a, in a prison in North Georgia. And in that prison, when I was preaching in North Georgia, there's probably 300 inmates in there. And I was preaching the message about the gates of hell out of Matthew 16 cannot prevail. And I said, there is no such place as hell as you've been told that there was a hell that burns with fire. I said, that doesn't exist. I said, yeah, that's not anywhere in the Bible. And I said, I can show you that. And uh, I was preaching to these preachers. And man, they were loving it. You know how you figure? You get here, all these guys, they in there because they want hell. They know they are. Preachers don't preach them in hell. They want it. And the chaplain, he got all bit out of shape. He went to the warden. He said, that hey, preacher Hayes, and I've been going to this prison quite regularly. I go, every, I go once a month on a regular basis. A lot of them I got to know. And uh, I'd gone back down there a week, and, and the warden said, Lynn, he said, I'm going to have to ask you to go into a different cell group, cell off, because somebody has said something. I said, well, who was it? He said, it was the chaplain. I said, well, could me and you and that chaplain have a discussion? He said, yeah, let's do that because I ain't found nothing wrong with what you're saying. 
And he'd come in and listen to a lot of the things I preached. He agreed with me. Matter of fact, he was on my monthly CD. <laughs> so we went in there and I said, uh, I said, you have a Bible right there on your uh, bookshelf behind your desk there. I could see it, you know, and I, I knew what it was and I knew the kind of translation it was. I said, it's New American Standard. I said, that's even better. He said, yeah, I do. I said, well, turn, turn it into Matthew 16, 18, and, and read it out to me. And he started reading. He said, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. And I said, that's exactly what I told those guys, the gates of Hades. I said, Hades is a Greek word simply means the realm that you can't see. Unseen realm. I said, that's what the word means. I said, it's a Greek word. I said, it means unseen realm. And I said, instead of saying that, your translation uses the Greek word, Hades. Oh, this chapter says here, oh, no, that ain't right. That is wrong. That, that's, that's a bad trail. He said, I got it right here in the King James Version. The authorized King James Bible says, the gates of hell. It talks about the, the burning pit. I said, see, that's the problem right there, Chapman. He's reading out of a translation that's translated from many other translations. You're reading out of a transliteration that's just giving you a Hebrew or a Greek word. I said, the word Hades actually in the Greek means the world is not seen. That's all it means. It just means it, it's a world. It, it exists right here, right now. Mm -hmm. It's right here, right now. And I said, that's Hades. I said, it's a world you can't see it with your physical eye. Now, if you open up your pineal gland, you can probably see it. My God. There's a lot more in here than y'all think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A whole lot more in here than you see. Why? Because you base everything on what you see through your dual vision, through your divided vision. Yes. Yes. You base very little that you see through your single eye. Jesus said, Matthew 6, if your eye is single, in other words, if you're looking through this eye up here, this eye that sits between the 24 elders, this eye that is the all-seeing eye of God, if you yes. see through that eye, it's single, it'll tell you the truth. Uh, yes, yes. Needless to say, me and the chaplain kind of had a splitting of the ways that night, but me and the warden, the warden said, hey, you know, I love what you're saying. If you would tonight, go in a different group of cell group. Speak to them guys. I did. The guys in the cell group where I'd been leased, and they got a petition. They said, we want Preacher Hayes back. <laughs> so the next time I was down there, the ward said, Lean, you have to go back and have said, get what the chaplain said. <laughs> Upsets the religious apple cart, don't no. Yes. Because you see, what I'm sharing with you will free you. What I'm sharing with you will not put you in any bondage whatsoever. It will make you responsible to you because I ain't. Yeah. And I ain't going to make you do anything. You, I'm going to love you, period. I don't care what you do. Yeah. I don't care. It, it's not better to judge. Yeah. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Do not judge anybody for anything. I mean, how, how much clearer can you get? What is that to the folk of me? Let's just take this right here for just a moment and I'll, I'll kind of quit or close or look. I may go ahead and revisit the book of Revelations on these studies here. Oh, God. Yes, yeah, he still. Let me do this. Let me just close on this passage right here. Revelations chapter 20. Uh, Revelations chapter 20. You have, we have terminologies that you find in New Testament Greek. New Testament Greek that are not found at all in the Old Testament Hebrew. You will not find the word devil or demon in Hebrew in the Old Testament. It is not there. The only place you'll find that is in the New Testament coming right out of Greek mythology. But our problem is we do not know what devil and demon means in Greek mythology. Devil and demon in Greek mythology just means a picture of yourself. It's a, it's a mirror image of yourself. If we knew that, we could read the stories and not be offended and not even make judgment against somebody that you say has got a demon. Because every one of you got demons. Yeah. Every one of us. Demons are just simply thoughts. They're just thoughts that reflect back to you what you're doing. That's all they are. They're not right or wrong. I mean, but I know that's what we we draw that conclusion. But right here in verse verse ten, Revelation chapter twenty, verse ten, and I'm gonna I'm just going to interpret this from its original Greek for you. It says, and the, and the devil 
No, that's just adversarial, adversarial thoughts. That deceives you. That's what they do. Your adversarial thoughts, your demons and your devils. Mm -hmm. They're just they're just thoughts. They're just if you you know if you don't pay them any mind, if you will just not even don't ever repeat them if you don't like them. Don't ever tell somebody about them. <laughs> you, know, you know what we do all the time? We have that little demon, that little thought. Oh, I have this thought. Let me just tell you about the thought you had. And then all you do is you give life to the stupid thoughts that you had that was nothing but a demon. Whereas if you hadn't have said anything about it, tomorrow you'd forget it. I guarantee you, you ain't remember right now anything you thought yesterday. You, ain't gonna, you don't remember unless you gave word for it. Unless you said it to somebody and y'all got conversation about it and y'all got talking about it and then you sow seeds. And then you pray for crop failure. God, I know all them words coming back up. So the devil deceived them was cast into the lake. Everybody say lake. lake. Everybody say la me. La me. That's the Greek word. La me. The word, listen to me. The word la me in Greek means a safe place. It's referring to a harbor in a in any dock or in any anywhere where there is a harbor. And the harbor is a safe place for the ship to tie during a storm. That's what the word la me means. A safe place. A safe place. La me. It's used that way in Acts 27. You remember in Acts 27? When Paul was out in the, out in the uh, storm and God told him, you're going to, just, you're going to lose everything if you don't get to this, this harbor. Actually, it calls it a harbor. And he went to this particular harbor. He tied the ship. The ship was saved. And he went back out. That's what this word means. Now, I want, I want you to hear this now. Was cast into a safe place. <laughs> Can you say that? La me? La me. Say that. La me is a safe place. A safe place of what? What does it say? Fire. A fire. You mean fire is a safe place? That word fire in Greek is the word pur. P U R. Do you know what we get from that Greek word P U R? We get this word. Pure. pure. It's a safe place of pure purity. You know what they told you? They told you this is hell fire. Yeah. And look, look, look what else he said. It, he said, I'm cast into a lake, safe place of fire, purity, and brimstone. You know what this word brimstone? Yeah. It's theon. Theon. You know what the root of this word theon is? Theos. Do y'all have any idea what Theos is? God. Exactly. I'm going to cast you into a safe place of purity in God. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, God. And the translators just call it fire and brimstone. Oh, my God. You're going to burn fire and brimstone forever and ever. Oh. Ain't ever going to get done. Mm -hmm. Only place in the entire Bible to come up with a stupid doctrine. Right here. Why? Because they didn't know. They didn't take time or, or whatever. Or they did the same thing I did the first five years that I preached. I just regurgitated the things the popular preachers said. God, I see that going constantly all the time. A real popular preacher gets up because he has a real way, charismatic with words, just gets slammed and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and the little younger preacher said, man, that's so good. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to preach that again. And they do it. And they do it. And they do it. There's no research, there's no study, there's no accountability. They get in the front of crowds of people and people get all excited and all enthused and get all emotional and get nothing. God help us. Because that theology teacher at the Nicene Council. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 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 That's exactly what happened. So if I turn within myself. You me tell you what you're going to find in there? You're going to find a voice. And in that voice you're going to find that that is actually the voice of God and that's the, actually a pure place. Yes. It is a place where God will purify you. It tells you in Hebrews chapter 12, chapter 13 that God is a consuming fire. Yes. I'll just go over there and read that to you because I know that, that's really tough for most people. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. God is the lake of fire that purifies you, cleanses you of the, th of the many things, whatever they might be. I mean, that's, that's the place you want to go. <laughs> it's all going to hell. We get a trip, let's it all go there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> we go to this place of fire, of purification. Key is to open your mind, turn within, not around, not about. There's where God's at. Turn within and listen to that voice. It's there. It, it may take some practice. You know what I'm saying? It's just like it's just like meditations that you do. The meditation. Most of the prayers that we do are just futile. Sorry to say. I'm sorry to say that, but they are. Yeah. yeah. But the, the because they're begging something outside you. Please do yeah. something. When already that that's inside you is just sitting there saying, oh, Hello, I'm in here. Uh, who are you talking to out there? Ain't nobody out there. I'm in here. Hello. <laughs> We're too busy, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, God, you don't understand. <laughs> we do. I do. I do. I did. I did. And now I need to get quiet. Yes. I need to turn them in. Yes. I need to listen because there's a voice inside me. So great. So powerful. So loving. So loving. Not judgmental. Yes. Wooing me, drawing me. Say, here, here's my will. And I tell you, God's will for me is not God's will for you. You have to find God's will for yourself. Yeah, that's right. And then you follow that. You follow that path. Yeah. Yes. We become doers of that. Whoa. <laughs> Not only to find peace, but find fulfillment. Quit lying to ourselves. Whoo! Hallelujah. Amen. 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 All right. We'll, we'll think about that. We'll come back and revisit the book of Revelation.